GDC 2018, who's excited? Yeah, all right. So I'm going to get us started with a really uplifting talk uh, about surviving failure. Um, so I actually, uh, this is my second time talking about this. Uh, uh, last year I gave a talk specifically on like the technical failures of Brigador. My name is Human and by the way, I made a game called Brigador a while back. Um, and if you want the like nitty gritty of all the poor decisions I made, that's the last year's talk. Um, something like Brigador failure or something. Um, I hadn't yet graduated to being able to add the surviving part of the title. Um, so that's what I look forward to giving this one. Um, I'm much more concerned here with just sort of the, the post uh, postpartum depression kind of period of, of like when you have this thing happen, how do you deal with it? Um, and so as part of uh, some research and preparation for my talk, I figured I would look into what other people have already said, you know, because if I, I didn't want to just repeat what's already the combined wisdom on the internet. Um, so I actually decided to record some of the, some real helpful nuggets um, that I found. Uh, I read an entire article on how to become a growth hacker uh, to, <laughs> to deal with failure. Um, I read the entire article and I still don't actually know what they meant. Um, another one is uh, set yourself up to win no matter what. Um, I think that's just called cheating. Um, again, not entirely clear on that one. Um, gamify your failure. Uh, you know, because uh, game dev is, isn't enough of a free-to-play grind as it is. You want to make sure you get some real good nuggets in there. And then my, my absolute favorite was uh, just remove absolute failure as an option. <laughs> if only I had known when I started this project that I can just not have failure as an option, that would have made things so much easier. Um, but yeah, so just what I found was a lot of platitudes and quick tips and no one really acknowledging how it can just really suck sometimes uh, to fail. And no one really acknowledged that or really talks about how to deal with that. Um, so here to talk about how things can really suck sometimes, uh, my name is Hugh again. Uh, I started a company called Stellar Jockeys back in 2011. Uh, in the summer of 2016, we launched a game called Brigador. Um, and that launch went so well, we pretended it didn't happen and just tried it again a year later. Um, and uh, I don't know uh, how many of you know me personally versus like the game versus a certain post I wrote one time. Um, some people describe it as a meltdown. I think that's maybe a little aggressive. Um, but yeah, so long story short is, we had a launch in summer 2016. It went poorly, um, and uh, and that's fine. Like that happens. But I was a lot more raw coming out of that than I really needed to be, and that dramatically affected the next six months of my life. Um, and I also wrote some stuff on the internet, uh, which was maybe a little more. Uh, uh, spicy than it needed to be. Um, but now 210,000 people have read it, so that's kind of a little too late to put the genie back in the bottle. Um, but yeah, so why did I feel so burned? Um, I did, and I, I accidentally, there were just a lot of things. It was my first time shipping a game, and my first time really committing to uh, uh, an experience of, of that kind of magnitude. I mean, uh, the only other thing really commensurate to game dev, especially when you're young, like I started, we started working on Brigador when I was 23, um, was like going through college, and uh, there's other things to like help relax you on that. Um, so one of the biggest things is expectation versus reality. Um, and for me, there was a huge gap between what I expected for the launch of Brigador and what the reality was. Um, it's natural for though there, there to be a disparity there. Um, and one of the kind of frustrating ironies of being a more experienced developer is that you learn to better attune yourself to, uh, like, attune those expectations to what is likely to happen. Um, but what ends up happening is that at some point, there's a, 
a moment of reckoning, um, or maybe if you're lucky, like a, a period of time in which those two things come together. Uh, and if that happens very quickly, like with a game launch, when you have this kind of catastrophic realization that I've made a huge mistake, um, then uh, that can be very jarring. Uh, ideally, <laughs> making that shift uh, should be either it's a small shift and it's gonna be a soft experience, um, or uh, you have enough time to gradually bridge the gap. What happened to me uh, in 2016 was more something like this. Um, so there's actually a great film called 500 Days of Summer. Um, and there's, it's a great movie on the whole, but there's also a, a segment that's a few minutes long that uh, I think very uh, succinctly um, just describes and illustrates not only the difference there, but the impact that that can have. Um, now, the, the caveat here is that it's not that we shouldn't just lower our expectations. Um, I'm not telling anyone to do that. Um, but I think there's kind of a third step you can add, which is aspiration versus expectation versus reality, right? We can aspire to be the best, and you should, like there's nothing wrong with, with striving for that, but you need that kind of middle ground of, okay, like what, what's actually gonna happen? Because if you don't protect yourself with that, then um, you can end up with uh, this kind of whiplash that happens when you have to reconcile those things. Um, so the second thing that I did was that I, because I put everything into the launch, uh, and I sort of just assumed that things were going to go well enough that I would be fine, when it didn't, I had nothing left in the tank to help cope with the failure. So um, I was just sort of stuck in this awkward situation afterwards. Um, and I wasn't, uh, I got into this cycle where uh, any time I was getting into any kind of recovery, uh, any energy that I was getting back, any joie de vivre, was immediately spent on working on the game. So as soon as I like, got, got any of that back, I would burn real hard for like a day or a week or a month or like however long that I, I had that juice going for. And then I would put myself right back to where I was the day after that launch. Um, and the third thing is that I was, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, burnout and crunch and a lot of these things. Um, it's different to be faced with that yourself and then to have to actually acknowledge that, you know, I'm not able to work or, you know, to continue at this level of performance that I had been going on for a while. Because um, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's a frustrating thing to, to, to admit. Um, and I, in that period afterward, I was like, I'm just gonna keep working the way I have been for the last couple years. Uh, and I couldn't accept that it's just so okay to have a hard time. Um, you need to have that kind of down period where uh, if you go through an experience like a really bad launch that you spent five years on, um, there's, there's gonna be, like you need, you need time for that fallout to settle and to, to give yourself a chance to recover. Um, when you go through an experience like that, you have two jobs, which is to get better, um, and was what I described with uh, don't like immediately burn yourself back out, and also don't make things worse. Um, I got real close with that post uh, that I showed earlier. If that had been tonally a little bit different, or maybe you know under different circumstances, that could have totally blown up um, in a in a bad way. Uh, it was you know it worked out okay for me, but. Um, you know, don't, this, this kind of stuff feels real good, um, but that, that impulse is, is, you have to be very careful about. Um, the one time I think I, I did handle it much better was uh, following our early access launch, um, I was getting hassled by a customer, not, not even a customer, a person who was uh, suggesting that our, you know, are, are informing me politely that our price should be down uh, at $15, and it was, uh, it was one thing to like get a couple, like everyone gets comments and stuff, but when it becomes like a daily uh, repeat and like genuinely confused, like why didn't you listen to my advice? Um, that, that was when I you know, responded with the whole uh, price post with the uh, Nickelback poster thing. Um, 
But that was actually the second draft uh, of the post that I had written. Um, the first response that I had written was a lot more inflammatory. Um, <laughs> it was a lot more obscenities. And the, if I had posted that, the response would have been something a little bit more like this. Um, and I know people say that like any press is good press, but I, I think there's a line there. Um, so uh, a final point is that uh, this sort of relation of time to distance to understanding. So um, one of the, uh, it wasn't until basically six months after our uh, 1.0 launch in, in uh, summer 2016 that I actually uh, calmed down and got enough uh, perspective on uh, what had happened to actually start doing something about it, to start addressing it properly, both from a dev side and also from a personal side. Um, there's the, the classic phrase, seeing the forest for the trees. Um, this idea that you know, I, when you're in the middle of development, you're right in the thick of it, and you need to be able to back away a little bit and see the whole picture. And like the only way that you can get that distance is with time. Um, and then that last little bit is that you have to get some understanding of your situation in order to be able to assess it. And once you have that opportunity to assess where you are, whatever, whatever has happened, you know, either game dev or personal experiences, whatever that event in your life is, um, you can then, the, the decision ultimately boils down to, do you salvage whatever, like spend more time and energy to salvage whatever thing you're in, or do you step away and move on? Um, and so, you know, happy ending. In, in our particular case with Brigador, uh, I realized that a lot of those mistakes were relatively small things that I could correct. Um, and so we dedicated another six months to actually fixing the game. We relaunched it and have since actually made it to be a properly earning title. So that, that worked out okay. Um, and the, uh, there's a nice little quote from uh, the director, Christopher Nolan, which is, he just talks about how um, persistence uh, is 90% of the battle. And then he goes on to say, well, it's actually 70%, but 90% sounds much better. Um, but that um, uh, something I, I had hoped to do with this talk and with other times that I've, I've spoken either online or, or in person is just that we, everyone wants to cultivate a culture of, of success and, a, and an aura of success around them. It's the whole Facebook uh, syndrome, right? Um, no one wants to appear like they're having trouble. And I think that's a natural impulse, but at the same time, that can be unhealthy for the community as a whole. Uh, and I know for me personally, um, it wasn't until I started reading about how other developers, both in the games industry, but also in film, like uh, you know, other people who have started these big projects had profound uh, issues, either, either failures or you know, struggles and things, and was able to start relating those to my own experience that I then uh, was able to sort of pick up and move on. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, it just comes down to uh, this guy. Alright, thank you very everyone. One moment. Oops, nope, that's Hugh again. Hold on. Hello, isn't it? Hi. Hello. Oh, Hugh. Hi. Yes. Um, thanks very much, Hugh. That was really good. Um, do you think that, for yourself, part of the issue is that because of social now, a lot of what we do is uh, accessible to all, so you're watched constantly, and did that have an effect as you were working on your game? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's the, you, 
definitely being, well, I mean, that's a decision you have to make, right? So we, uh, for a significant portion of development, um, uh, so I, I live in Champaign, Illinois. Um, Volition is there, but no one else. Uh, and when we were just starting out, I was too afraid to talk to anyone at Volition. So we functionally operated in like complete isolation for about three years. Um, and it wasn't until we started having something to show that I um, started actually branching out into social media. Probably started doing that a few years too late. Um, but, okay, so, so to actually address your question, yes, I think uh, having a presence on social media and having that observed effect, uh, or being observed has a huge effect on development. Um, but it also has to do with uh, I think your ability to temper that as a developer. So if you are someone for whom uh, like having, uh, you know, the opinions of others, like if, if that's a, an important thing to you, uh, and especially I think with smaller teams, you feel that more intensely, um, that can be a great impact if you're getting positive response, but you know, on the negative side of that, so I, I guess there's still the option of sealing yourself off, and I think there are cases of um, giving a project kind of time in the uh, incubator until you're you're ready to show. But then that is an active decision of because like there's a lot of good and bad that can come with that. Um, anyway, sorry, I hope that I addressed your question. Yeah, but no all right, cheers. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Yeah. So hi, <laughs> yeah, you good job, good answer. Yes. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about the Moon Hunters mistake. Uh, you might know me as the captain of Kit Fox Games. Uh, Moon Hunters was our biggest project, probably, in press so far. Um, but we also released a Shrouded Isle last year. And we just announced Boyfriend Dungeon. Woo! Um, and I'm co-editing textbooks on the side. Um, but it seems like most indies that get press and attention appear to err too, like, on the side of waiting too long to release their games, um, extending their launch date again and again for years and years. And then if that's right for you, that's fine. And we're all different people. Um, some people have that flaw. My flaw is the other side of the coin. And I know that I need to worry about not launching too too early, because that's what we did. Um, luckily, now I know the warning signs that I'm ready to share with you. Um, and this was 100% my call to make. I want to emphasize that my team was incredible, and they gave me all the power to make this decision, and I made it badly. So here I am. I called it wrong. Um, back into early 2016, uh, we were getting ready to launch our biggest game. Uh, Moon Hunters was very exciting for us. We'd been working on it for only a little over two years, so it was, it was ripe and ready. And we'd done a lot of promotion throughout the years in Montreal, at events, at PAX, and online with li weekly live streams. Uh, we basically felt like we were living in this giant hot spotlight. And we had had a successful Kickstarter. $178,000 isn't like breaking any records, but for a first major game and a new IP from a new studio, um, I mean, 400% and 6,000 backers was very exciting and something to be proud of. And I mean, we didn't even have a mid-campaign slump. Um, it seemed like it had its own word of mouth power. It would somehow organically grow out there on the internet. And in the years following, I gave lots of talks about how to run a successful Kickstarter. <laughs> and I mean, all this coverage and word of mouth, uh, it seemed like it was paying off. We'd, we got into showcases, we won awards, we were on the covers of magazines. I mean, we were bombarded with publishing offers, which we discarded. Um, and so, I mean, we, we got a little bit cocky. <laughs> uh, it was reasonable to think that it was a good sign of sales to come. Uh, everyone that I talked to told me we had a hit on our hands. Um, we actually launched with months of cash in the bank and a contract that was ready to sign. We had no financial pressure to launch at all, and yet we still launched early. In fact, we had so much visibility and so much good fortune that our launch moment was filmed by a crew from PBS for a TV series on tech and culture, which we'll come back in a moment. Uh, the launch was bad. I, I don't know if you've gotten that <laughs> from what I've said so far, but uh, we disappointed our fans. Um, I mean, you can't please everyone, of course, but we did have to admit to ourselves that we'd launched with a lot of bugs and maybe, well, definitely worse, a few core systems that we felt needed serious changes. 
So we ended up with a mixed Steam review user rating uh, in, the, in the half, like on and off in the launch month, uh, which kind of tanked our whole visibility. Uh, Metacritic was not much better. And I think, honestly, the hardest thing was seeing other devs, um, especially acquaintances, um, kind of treat me a little bit differently than they had back when they thought that I had a hit. And now that I didn't, it was different. And to make matters worse, a mainstream audiences were already set up to doubt the game's integrity. I mean, of course, some of these people would never have bought the game. They weren't our audience. But it still kind of like, was not fun to know that our technical problems would prove the indie skeptics right in calling us low-rent garbage. Like, that's not a good feeling either. And there were measurable consequences to this problem. Uh, this mistake uh, cost us a lot. Uh, this is how you tell it's a healthy launch week, by the way. Our next launch went much better in terms of um, how the launch week went. So you can see, even if that peak is not as high, the fact that it's, it's fatter throughout the days. This is just the first three days of the launch week. Um, it means people who are buying it are telling their friends. That's a good launch uh, week looking. As unlike Moon Hunters, <laughs> which launched and the hype train hit this big wall. Um, so you can see which one is going to have a better next four days, for example. I mean, launch days don't determine everything about your revenue, um, but it did determine a lot of the coverage and apparent success of the game for the next six months to a year. I can't help but think if that we'd waited to launch the game until it was actually ready, then our Metacritic and user reviews might have been much higher, and all of that would have led to even higher spikes down the road, um, which would have amounted to additional hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is what PBS had to say. Um, sales weren't great, thanks PBS, um, but that's what happens when you game, release a game that isn't ready. Um, and despite our launch day being better than a lot of indies, I'm very grateful for what um, luck we did have. Um, I, we could tell that this coming year, we might not have enough money to sustain the studio at the size and the comfort level that we were getting used to. And even aside from the money, uh, I mean, I prepared myself emotionally for bad sales. Uh, that's why I had signed this other contract um, beforehand. But I hadn't really considered seriously that we might disappoint people and make what could be called a bad game. Uh, we were heartbroken. It felt like we'd wasted years of our lives making something that wasn't really worth all that time and energy. It made me feel like I'd peaked and that I was old and tired. And in hindsight, we totally should have known better. One YouTuber went so far as to write me a heartfelt letter during the beta, pleading with me to delay the launch. Uh, but I ignored that and all the other warning signs, because hindsight's so great. Um, so why did we launch too early? If we set aside the hindsight bias um, and think about the moment, I'm going to lay bare all of my personal flaws for you so that you can see if any of this sounds familiar, you might have a similar problem. Um, indies often go around saying you should double or triple all your estimates and then double them again, and it makes me want to scream um, because production is actually a skill and it's worth practicing. Um, and so I get a little bit defiant when people start telling me you're going to keep delaying your game. Ha ha ha, your launch date isn't real. Um, in fact, I got really like, like fuck you, defiant. <laughs> um, and it is totally possible to, to, to release your game on schedule, I promise. Um, but don't give up everything and uh, obsess on that, maybe. And so it came to pass that each delay that we added to the game, even like a week of delay, felt like a personal attack on me and my production skill. And I felt, started feeling kind of fraudulent. And so I irrationally had decided we couldn't delay again. We just couldn't. It was a law of the universe now, um, which was incorrect. Um, and the team morale was getting a little bit low, and I'm, I'm a cheerleader type personality, so we weren't crunching particularly. We were working pretty hard, um, and finishing projects is exhausting. Even if you only work 40 hours a week, you're multitasking, you're prioritizing, you're, you're compromising, and just finishing a game is, is really difficult. So I was looking at the team, and we'd already delayed by a few weeks, and I thought, well, um, you know, I want, I want them to be happy again. Let's release the game. Um, but releasing a bad game does not make anyone happy, it turns out. And I also worried about launching next to a couple of other indie games um, and during other game events like GDC and PAX and things. And in the greater scheme of things, um, I, I think there are actually much bigger things to worry about. The quality of your game is much more important than probably any other indie game, to be completely honest. 
And this might be very Moon Hunter specific, but due to various factors, we undervalued the online multiplayer and we launched with it in a beta mode, which we thought was fine. We marked it beta. Um, still, most of the down thumbs were bad online multiplayer related, and they would never revise those no matter how we pleaded with them after we fixed the bugs. Um, and yeah, we thought it would be okay if the online multiplayer took a little while. That was incorrect. And I, as I mentioned, we had lined up this contract that was starting very soon afterwards, um, and I'd already delayed that by a few weeks, and so I let this external factor kind of influence me and make me think that uh, we absolutely had to stop um, working on the game. And it's true that at that point, because I had scheduled this contract to start, if I had delayed again, it was theoretically possible that the game would then sell zero copies and that contract would be null and void and then Kit Fox would close. So it, it felt like the right thing at the time to prioritize this other external factor. And we did eventually do okay. Uh, Kid Fox survived. Moon Hunters actually did pretty well over time. Um, some of it is my personal excellent luck. I'm a very lucky person, and I try to stay grateful for that. But we also did work really hard at it. We spent a lot of time fixing bugs and apologizing and answering emails. We also spent about six months making a free DLC afterwards uh, called Eternal Echoes, and that did the core systems revising that I mentioned before. Um, and so that gave us kind of another attempt at attracting press, and it gave us a more of a peace of mind as well to leave the game in a better state that we were proud of. So even if it hadn't resulted in a sales boost, we still would have been glad that we did it. Um, and also, making this would have been so much faster before launch. Um, if you have something you want to add to the game and you can afford to delay it, just like put it in the game first because live ops is horrendously distracting. And the reviews did trend mostly upwards afterwards. After we made all those improvements, um, I think we actually were able to harvest the goodwill that we'd built up from the Kickstarter updates that we were constantly making. Um, and maybe our community is more forgiving than the average Steam player. Um, I guess we'll never know. Uh, one thing that I do want to emphasize is the importance of our launch party, actually. Uh, my team and I definitely felt like we received first aid from the Montreal community itself um, by hosting our launch party three days later. Um, like, there's nothing that can replace the feeling of people who genuinely are happy for you and, and being proud of you and excited for you. Everyone on the team kind of wanted to cancel the launch party, um, but we did it anyway. And we were all really, everybody on the team was also grateful that we did afterwards. Um, there were sad tears and then happy tears. <laughs> um, so if you're thinking about canceling your launch party or making it hinge on the success of the game, do not do that. Um, even if you have to make it BYOB, that's okay. But take your moment to, to celebrate that you did something. And personally, I was actually healed by coming to GDC the week after launching. Um, I thought it would be massively humiliating. And instead, it was comforting. Um, even though a few professional acquaintances did treat me a little bit differently, um, I did actually find out who my friends were among the community um, who could uh, share with me their experiences from around the world. And because whenever I told someone about my disappointment, more experienced indies would lean in and nod sagely and tell me a horror story that was way worse, <laughs> which I'd never heard of. <laughs> Like, we only talk about success. I mean, all I say in public is Moon Hunter is totally successful. Yeah, it was great. Um, but for those of you who are in the audience right now, please understand that games go off the tracks all the time. It's okay, you're not uniquely humiliated. <laughs> it's kind of part of it. Um, so that's part of why I volunteered to be here today because I not only want to combat survivorship bias, but gen generally improve our culture and help us understand that, that failure is part of craftsmanship. And all that visibility that we'd created before didn't vaporize. Uh, we, I was able to do some hustling and uh, get an indie box in the works. And thank you, Jamie Tucker, for including us in your cool Steam Cross promo. That was great. Um, and then after we ported the game to all three major consoles, um, here's us uh, porting it to PS4 when the, the actual porting programmers in Japan at the time, which was a little bit funny. Um, 
Oh, I wanted to mention that the halo effect is, is totally real, um, at least it was for Moon Hunters, that every time we would release on a new platform, our Steam sales would get a boost. Um, and I think that if we had simultaneously launched all of the games on all the platforms, which is the tr conventional wisdom, well, we couldn't have done that physically anyway. We were incapable. But even if we had, I think it, the halo effect would have been kind of negated by the fact that our Steam score was so low. So it was really good that we were able to put the best version on the platform after we had kind of salvaged that. And most importantly to the future of the studio, we've incorporated all of these lessons into our workflows going forward. So our production evaluations for milestones are now less about specific dates and much more about what the deliveries themselves are and whether they are up to par. So we're more willing to add some time to the schedule um, as assuming that um, everything is up to, up to quality. And survival of the studio is definitely number one still in my mind. Uh, Kit Fox is not allowed to close. But in the past, we failed to prioritize beyond that. So my own personal production neuroses would come through. And kind of efficiency became more important than quality. Um, and that, that was by accident because we didn't really examine it. So now we're very clearly, officially, quality is more important than efficiency. Um, so assuming that you're not going to close the studio with your little uh, you know, flares here and there, then take your time um, and make it the best you can. Because it's true what they say, you do only launch once. Uh, delaying your game isn't nearly as bad as launching a bad game. <laughs> uh, and reality is probably more important than your pride. Your team's morale will be better when they believe in the game and feel good about what they've made. So if you're like me and you're prone to rushing ahead and you're an impatient person, uh, just take a breath, recheck your calculations, bring in fresh eyes, uh, double check all of your assumptions. We're applying all of this to development of Boyfriend Dungeon, which is our next game. So wish us luck with that. Uh, we actually have a milestone next week, so <laughs> we'll see. And hopefully we're learning from our mistakes and making better and better games. Thank you. So yeah, we have um, plenty of time for questions for I either speaker. And just make sure to yeah, go to one of the microphones, please. Let's start the interrogation. And don't forget to do your evaluations. Seriously though, any questions are cool. Actual questions, not I have a, a comment maybe. Hello. Hi. How's it going? It's excellent. Uh, this question's for you primarily. Um, I've had the experience where I've had friends who have like metaphorically grabbed me by the shoulders and shaken me and saying like, you need to finish. Like finishing is super important and uh, don't just stay in development forever and almost yell at me to, you know, move forward. Uh, do you have like a, res like outside of like actual financial pressure, like you're going to close if you don't start releasing something, like how would you respond to that? I would say I, I am probably unusual. It does seem to me that I am an outlier and that most people err on the other side. Um, like I said at the beginning, I think most indies tend towards um, just working in a cave forever on their perfect dream. Um, whereas I am much more of a flurry of like, let's just do it. Um, if, and so you have to look inside yourself to see what is your nat nature. Um, and how do you prevent that from calcifying? Because on both ends of the spectrum, there are problems. And I guess my, I feel like my side of the spe spectrum isn't talked about as much. Um, it's just seen as obvious, whereas sitting in a room and working on it for way too long is, is less obvious somehow. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I, I can't answer for you in particular. Only you can know your heart. Um, but I would say that Finishing is important. Maybe, maybe look up production practices. I think if we all started being more hygienic about how we estimate our tasks and think about how long things actually take us and calculate that and check our assumptions on our timelines, then we'll all be happier. Um, if I could chip in on that. Sure. The, um, one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the industry in the last 20 years is the fact that um, I think the vast majority of us in this room, when we're shipping a game, we're shipping purely digitally, right? Um, and that the environment for shipping a game has totally changed, right? So you've got options for um, early access. You can just get on Steam for 100 bucks now. Um, you can also do uh, various forms of closed beta or closed alpha. Um, look at Spy Party. Look at uh, um, uh, Saltzman's Overland. What was the the Vinji's current game, um, Overland? 
Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can basically get the kind of feedback you need from a player base um, and like keep it to only the diehards to figure out are we ready to ship or not because if you've got a bunch of people like the people who would love you screaming um, then it's like okay maybe we should delay it but otherwise if everyone's like thumbs up then yeah you, that you can get a degree of external evaluation from people who don't have uh, you know, an influence on that. And One thing I would mention is actually um, there are part-time producers that you can hire out there. Felix Kramer is incredible. Um, there's a bunch of a bunch of part-time producers that you should totally think about throwing a couple hundred dollars on because it's probably worth it to get a real professional to look at your timeline and tell you and look at your game and give you an expert ass assessment of whether or not you're ready to ship. Thank you both. Cheers. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Blake. Um, my Hi, Blake. Question, thank you. My question is for Hugh. Um, you said you relaunched like six months after your first launch? Uh, a year. So our first launch, so early access was October 2015. Um, 1.0 was June 2016. Up Armored, our relaunch was June 2017. So year to the day. And it sounded like the second relaunch was better or more successful? Um, so the week of our relaunch was our highest grossing sales of all time. And we, um, we sort of defied the trend in that for most people, um, your first year is basically like the majority of what you're going to make. Um, I know Jake Burkett is here in the audience somewhere. He gave some lovely talks about assessing sort of first week and first year sales and things like that. Um, for us, our second year of sales is actually significantly higher than our first year. So. Actually, ours was too. Yeah, so my question is, um, after your first launch, uh, what made you think you could relaunch and then what decisions are, like, what did you kind of, what do you think contributed most to kind of changing that trajectory and, and how did sure. that be successful? Um, yeah, uh, so uh, a couple things. One is just that there were some very discreet decisions that became very apparent were wrong after our launch. So the biggest one is our control scheme. So we launched Brigador with tank controls. Um, turns out no one plays tank controls anymore. Um, and in my mind, so it's, it's possible to be right and wrong at the same time. So to me, I was right in that, yes, tank controls are the best control scheme for this game because we designed it for that. Um, I was wrong in that no one wants to learn tank controls. Uh, so once we added, uh, added in a twin stick style, we actually had a working variant of that before our original launch, and I cut it because I was like, I am more intelligent than these gamers. Um, <laughs> Once we put that back in as part of the relaunch and a bunch of other, you know, there, there, were, there were very discrete decisions that I could clearly say, these are wrong. And looking at those in aggregate, plus localizing and a few other things, it was like, you know, I, I, I think this is worth it. And it, I talked to a lot of people who were like, this is, and your, your launch sucked way worse than it should have. Um, so it was kind of like an aggregate decision. Also the fact that, um, I was emotionally incapable of just stopping there, so it kind of like wasn't really a decision, but anyway. Thank you. I mean, hit me up if you want to talk later, yeah. So I'm Chris. Uh, my question is actually of a similar vein, uh, and I guess really goes to both of you, as to I know a lot of people when they have a launch that doesn't go well, like their, their concerns are that they spend more energy, more time, it's just gonna be spinning their tires in the mud, and they're not sure like, should they cut their losses and just you know, was their timing wrong and they got to take their bet on the next thing. Can you talk us to, I'm sure there's at least some consideration as to that kind of like before you decide to really double down on that effort, kind of what goes into that sort of thinking as to whether or not here comes the next project as opposed to like sinking that, you know, all those resources back into it. That, that could be an hour on its <laughs> own. Um, I guess my, my core advice there would be to to treat every game differently. It's not that you can look at any given game and say, oh, this game did it that way, I'm gonna do it that way. Um, every game has its own problems and triumphs. So it is worthwhile to see if there are others who have tried exactly what you're going to try and have failed to do so. It's very hard to find failures, but they are out there. Um, and I think you also need to ask yourself whether the costs, emotionally um, and financially, are worth the risk. Um, because we knew that we were going into this with maybe getting nothing out of it, and we were okay with that. 
but part of that might have been because we weren't completely bitter and burnt out um, at that point yet. <laughs> um, so it's different for every game. Um, what, what I would say about that is um, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, like what is your intention as an indie developer? Like, is this a one and done or are you a lifer? Because in my case, uh, we, so my, my brother and I co-founded the studio together and it's, um, <laughs> we're, we're in the kind of like indie games or die kind of mentality where our, our creations are so precious to us that uh, like we're gonna stick with it regardless. And um, as much as he occasionally accuses me of George Lucasing the game, um, I think, uh, you know, because games have really long tails, and I hopefully, like, I still play the original XCOM, uh, and people like that. That game still has a living community, and not, I mean, should be so lucky. But at the same time, it's like if someone plays Brigador in ten years, um, I wanted to make sure that that's still like a rock solid experience. And I realized that there were changes that we needed to make to do that, and. We were fortunate in that in our case, we're working on a second game that uses the same engine. So a lot of the additions and changes that we made to the engine to fix Brigador, it's like, well, this is, we're just doing pre-production for game two. So it worked out. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Hi, my name is Aubrey Scott. Um, I'm actually wondering, um, because you both talked about the stories of other game developers kind of failing being a really healing experience for you to, mm -hmm. to hear and kind of uh, commiserate together. I'm wondering what you um, feel like would have to happen to make that a more normal part of the culture to kind of cultivate that and have those stories out there and for it to be more normal to. That's what we're doing right now. <laughs> I mean, was, no, I'm, I'm, I'm entirely serious where like that was, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't, it wasn't my intent when I first like started yelling on the internet about how everything sucks. I, my, my mind wasn't like, I'm going to help the indie community. Um, I'm, I'm glad that happened and I, I've kind of embraced that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just, uh, part of it is just building your community, right? And like finding people who are in similar situations and commiserating. I mean, like it's, you, uh, there's, it, it helps to just talk to other devs in, in all states of life. And again, like I, I have had a really wonderful experience with the, with the game development community, uh, both Indie and AAA, where I've reached, I've cold emailed the weirdest people where there's like, you know, you're a technical director at this place. I'm an independent game designer. Like, please read this two page long email. Um, and I've had people actually, uh, not only humor me, but I actually give very thoughtful responses. And I, I think just, it starts with just reaching out to people. Um, and uh, when you are going through a situation, I mean, because I, we talk a lot, I mean, we, like as in developers, I've had a lot of private communications with, with other developers who are having a hard time and other things like that. It's not always necessary or even uh, a good thing to publicize some of these things or some of your, your stressors, but also like, you know, if you can talk to people about it, or if, if you do have an experience that you think other people are going to have and could be shared, or you know, someone else who's in that similar situation, I think if you contribute to that sort of body of knowledge and that experience, that that can make a difference. Um, I'd, I'd like to add, I'm in my uh, hobbies, I'm also the co-organizer of a feminist organization, and I can tell you that any cultural change is very slow, and it starts personally. So anytime you in your life can notice when you are overvaluing someone because they have this aura of success, or when you catch you and your friends like admiring someone because only um, they, they've kind of perfected this sheen, um, just question that and, and really think about that and think about who your heroes are and what are the kind of values that you want to broadcast to other people. And I think we'll make the world better. Thank you. Um, we have to call it there, and I think that is a perfect note to end on. Thank you so much. It was brilliantly articulated.